Thank you very much, uh, Nicole, and welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be asked to do this talk to try and put something back towards Aberdeen, place which had uh, a huge part in, in my life. Um, for the next sort of 40 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about concussion, sports concussion in particular, and how Scotland in particular has grasped uh, the concept of developing grassroots concussion guidance um, probably at a, well, yeah, a very fast rate, probably the, one of the fastest and, and most progressive parts of the world. Um, there are some other countries doing lots of great work now, but Scotland, um, we, we were one of the first people to do this a few years ago um, and still um, for a small country, we're, we're doing very well. So I put this date on um, mainly as a reminder to, to mention um, it's very timely this talk. Um, the, on the June next week in June on the 21st, um, or around the 21st, there will be the third version of the Scottish con government concussion guidance being launched. So it's timely that we're we're doing this now. Um, just trying to squeeze that announcement in before the general election dominates everything. So this is the photo. Um, from the media launch from 2018, the version two of the Scottish Government Sports Scotland Concussion Guidance. Um, and I just want you to look at it because I'm going to reference it later on. But I want you to note that on this picture, we've got the blue If In Doubt logo, which is the, the logo and the mantra of the project since it first began in 2015. Um, I also want you to know that we've got athletes and, and they're all genuine athletes in that photo, apart from the two in the suits. They won't let me say anything. <laughs> um, and that we've managed to represent most of the common sports in Scotland, uh, including Shinty on the left there, which I'm quite proud about. I spent a lot of time in the Highlands uh, working and uh, Shinty is an important sport for, for, uh, for many people in the top half of the country. Uh, so we've managed to be inclusive, but we've also managed to represent male and female sport, professional and amateur, uh, and you, you won't recognise probably some of the people in there, um, particularly draw your attention to the, the chap in the in the um, judo outfit. Um, he's a visually impaired Paralympic judo athlete, so we've tried to be as inclusive as we can in the 2018 launch, which was one of our major goals, oh, sorry, version two launch. The two chaps at front are important to mention. Uh, the, the, the guy on the right with the purple ties smiling, he's the chief medical officer um, for Scotland. Um, um, and, um, and the chap on the left is Peter Robinson, who, as I'll mention later on, was one of the key people for starting or founding the movement to try and develop the program that we now have in terms of grassroots concussion education. So through Peter, and Willie Stewart to our reference as well. And with Gregor, the Chief Medical Officer support, um, this is where we are just now. But remember the, the diversity on that photo because I will come back to it. Briefly, um, what's my connection to Aberdeen? Um, well, as a medic, I had most of my lectures in this building, Marshall College. It was a bit darker when I was there, but I think it's been sandblasted since. Um, but I was in Aberdeen from uh, when was I from there? From 1991 to 1997, um, and I had a fantastic time. And like a lot of people at university, I've still got many friends from that era um, who I'm in touch with more and more. But professionally, with regards to my sports medicine and my interests, the best thing that happened to me for Aberdeen was these two people. I got to work with two true world experts who sparked my So an extra degree in the middle of my medical studies, uh, looking at um, the shape of the inside of the knee in people who tear their cruciate ligaments using MRI scanning. And these were my two supervisors. The chap on the left is uh, Professor Frank Smith, uh, who's now deceased, unfortunately. Um, he was one of the pioneers, one of the sort of founding fathers of MRI scanning, which of course began in Aberdeen. Um, but interestingly, he was also a team doctor. So while he was supervising me, um, 
to my project. He used to take me to observe him being a team doctor at Montrose Football Club. Now, back then in the mid 90s, sports medicine as a team doctor did involve wearing a suit and eating a pie and sitting in the stand. Very unlike the team doctoring I do now. Um, but it really was Frank who sort of said to me, you know, actually, you know, yeah, you can do work with teams, you can work with sports. Why not? I'm a radiologist and I do it. And they're very diverse uh, skill mixers to do that. The chap on the right um, is uh, Nick Mafuli, Professor Nicola Mafuli, um, who was my other supervisor, my orthopedic supervisor. And Nick is now down in London. He's done some groundbreaking pieces of work around classification of tendon injuries. He himself was a former high level martial arts athlete. Um, so the, one of the great things for me for my career in Aberdeen was even though sports medicine was very embryonic in the 90s as a specialty and an opportunity, I worked with some fantastic people uh, who I'm you know, very, very, very lucky to have worked with. Um, last one about me, just, just to highlight, I did get a lot of, I was saying to my friends that I wanted to do sports medicine and I got a lot of ridicule from my friends. You can't do that. It's not a career. It's a hobby. Um, and this is my yearbook entry. Obviously, I've blacked a few bits out, my address, etc. Um, but this is my yearbook entry written by my flatmates and my colleagues. Obviously, they're, they're roasting me and we all roasted each other just for comedy for the yearbook. But they wrote a, last, a telling sentence at the end of my entry that hopefully this extra year, the year I spent with Frank and Nick, will allow him to achieve his full career potential that of sponge man of the local pub football team. So that is kind of how my colleagues viewed my sort of career plans and the sort of things I was saying in the 90s. Uh, how did it go? Well, I'm, I'm very lucky and it's, it's gone very well. I've been the chair of the Scottish Government Concussion Advisory Group since 2016. I'm the only NHS consultant in sport and exercise medicine in Scotland. And I also work for Sports Scotland on the Olympic programmes. I've been to three Olympic Games um, as a team physician with Team GB. I've, I've just been appointed the men's rugby team doctor for Scotland. I went to the 2018 FIFA World Cup with England um, in Russia as one of the team doctors. And I spent the last year working in Formula One. So yeah, I've, I've done uh, that pub, that uh, sponge man for the pub football team is doing all right. Um, concussion, by the way, is one of my interests. The other second interest which I've been heavily involved in is upskilling and training people in pitch side skills. So bridging that gap from being in a stand with, with Frank, having a pie, watching the football and examining people afterwards to physically working pitch side, um, parading the or patrolling the pitch line and uh, the sideline and being there in case there's an emergency incident. And there's many high profile ones that you will have seen and remember in football and rugby, high profile injuries and the standardized way in which we address those now. And I was one of a group of people, I still am, who managed to change the way that we we do that, um, both in elite sport and in grassroots. The World Rugby Grassroots course, by, um, for example, that we, we wrote, there's 15,000 people done that worldwide so that the quality and standard of pitch side care available at grassroots sport is greater on a global level. So that's enough about me. Um, back to the concussion project. Um, in the next half an hour or so, we'll talk about the history and evolution of those concussion guidance guidelines in Scotland, um, the difficulties of navigating as a clinician, trying to follow these, the, the topic or, or some quirks and nuances of, of the topic and what we do know and what we don't know about concussion, which is a huge topic in itself. Um, I'll try and give some clinical tips for any clinicians out there and then can't do a, a, a talk about concussion projects without thinking about the potential short, medium and long term problems of concussion. But I'm going to pitch that in the way of how can you try and educate your athletes to be uh, more honest and more conservative in their attitude towards concussion by how you put those messages across about potential problems. So this is where it all began. Um, I showed you Peter at the beginning on that um, group slide, who's the layperson representative who started this project. Peter is Ben's dad. Ben unfortunately died on the rugby field um, about 14, 15 years ago now uh, from a head injury, from concussion. 
Um, he actually died from a condition known as second impact syndrome, which is a, a slightly controversial terminology, uh, although the diagnosis isn't. Uh, and basically, Ben had two or three head impacts, head collisions during a rugby game where he didn't get up. And each time uh, the, the people that were there let him get to his feet, did a bit of finger waving in front of his eyes. Are you OK? Yes. And let him continue. But unfortunately, from the third one, he didn't get up and ultimately ended up uh, in intensive care and dying from a, a massive brain injury. So a, a tragic story. But on the back of that, Peter and and Ben's mum, Karen, have been advocates for if anything can come out of this, we want it to stop it happening to anybody else. And we want to educate people about con better concussion care. So Peter got together with um, uh, probably a well, well, high profile and well known academic from the University of Glasgow, uh, Willie Stewart, and they had a conversation about, you know, why, why is there not one single policy in Scotland for all concussion? Why, the, why is the guidance for football different than rugby, different than shinty, different than hockey? And so they then threw approaching those of us working in sports and Sports Scotland and the government thought Scotland's ideally placed to get a single policy um, and can we do it? So we did. Apologies, this photo is a bit grainy. It's actually quite hard to find old photos now because there's so many new ones. So this is the photo from the original launch in 2015 at Hamden. You'll note that here we have a lot of people in suits, a lot of great professionals in suits. Um, but we don't really have athletes. And that was one of our learning points from version one, which was let's just produce some guidance to version two was how do we get to the athletes? So we changed the face of what we try and do. In that photo, there are chief medical officers of um, Sports Scotland, Scottish Football Association, Scottish Government, as was Willie Stewart, Scottish Rugby. There's one Aberdeen connection on there who is the chap kneeling on the right with the very big and obvious lapels. Um, that's Dr. Andrew Murray. Um, I don't know if you know Andrew, but he's an Aberdeen graduate as well. Andrew's got a very high profile as a crazy endurance runner in that he had, um, he's a consultant in sports medicine too, but he, he had a TV crew, BBC TV crew, follow him as he ran from Scotland to the Sahara Desert. And he's done other crazy ultras like um, Seven, seven, seven ultra, seven continents, seven days, and things like that for charity. Um, so, and Andrew's another high-profile Aberdeen figure who is still central to the project. He's just not as visible on the imaging that we have now because we're making it more athlete-centered. Oh, there we go. When we said we're going to we're going to make a we're going to do some guidance, some single guidance. We, we could just make it up. Um, we could do our own literature search. But at the time, and still, there's a global organization called the Concussion and Sport Group, who are a group of academics and scientists who do all the, a lot of that work already um, in that they're constantly reviewing the available evidence and papers out there and presenting it at a big, sum, um, a big summary meeting. The meeting's always named after the city that the meeting's in. Uh, and in the last 20 years, they've been in Geneva, Zurich, Zurich, Berlin, and Amsterdam. So our initial guidance was based on the on the Zurich guidance, um, with a bit of tartanifying to make it more applicable to the Scot Scottish population. And then once the Berlin guidance was produced in 2017, we produced the Scottish guidance version two with all the athletes on the photo, 2018. <coughs> excuse me. And then Amsterdam. 2023 was another concussion and sport group summary meeting and from that and also another project which i'll talk about in a second um that's why it's time for scotland to revise and produce the scottish guidance version 3 2024. two of the things to say about the concussion and sport group one is they produce this thing called a scat tool or standardized concussion assessment tool um, that's not for grassroots sport that's for healthcare practitioners and you'll notice I say it's a tool, not a test. It's not a pass fail. There is no test for concussion. It's uh, you can rule it in, but you can't rule it out. Everything you do could be normal. 
So the, the reason this is a tool is that it's an organized way of looking at somebody with concussion to allow an experienced clinician to make a diagnosis. And that is why the motto of the Scottish uh, guidance is, if in doubt, sit them out, because you can't, once you've thought, could this be concussion? There is no test you can do pitch side that can go, it's not. So at grassroots level in particular, we need to protect people and move them away and see what happens. They could develop symptoms 24, 48, or even 72 hours later. The final thing to say about the concussion and support group is they're a bit controversial at the moment. And the reason for that is, is the chap uh, in the photograph there, um, Dr. Paul McCrory, uh, who was the one of the founding fathers of the, the body and a senior figure. Um, a lot of people felt, or a lot of people, concussion, um, the people who are involved in discussing concussion, they're often in a few camps and there's some challenges over civility around discussions. It's such a strong, emotive and serious topic. But there are a lot of people who were questioned that sometimes the concussion support group has got a lot of sports representatives who, are, and they question their independence. Um, Dr. McCrory, unfortunately, then had some problems uh, where he was accused and found guilty of plagiarism in some of his work on concussion, uh, which therefore that discredited his generation of the organisation. I would say that by the time they got to Amsterdam 2023, there'd been a leadership change. Um, but still, when you hear people talking about concussion and sport group, that uh, unfortunately still still sticks. But it is the, the biggest body of evidence and, and global evidence that we've got. Uh, and currently, for, certainly for Amsterdam, it's a, a global network of experienced practitioners, but with some sport input. So I'm just waiting for my slide. So what about taking that and how did we um develop our own guidance so we set up our own scientific advisory group and that's made up of academics from universities who've got an interest in brain injury or sports science or sports medicine we've got senior sports physicians and sports medics from the major sports organizations in scotland so that's sports scotland that's scottish rugby scottish football um and um I, I represented the Camden Association for Shinty as well. You can tell I'm very proud of my uh, my, my time in the north. Um, the Gregor Smith, Sir Gregor, Sir Gregor Smith, the um, chief medical officers on there. We now have some concussion education officers that I'll talk about shortly, and we have a layperson. And th this group would meet and steer the direction of the the um, the guidance that we've got, in particular with regards their local spin. So we've got evidence from or influence from Edinburgh, Glasgow. Don't actually have anybody from Aberdeen apart from me, sorry. Um, but um, yeah, so we have we have um, influence to to try and make the principles of what the concussion and sport group is saying in terms of the systematic reviews on on concussion and make it relevant to Scotland. The late person is, of course, um, Peter Robinson. Oh, sorry, excuse me. So again, I've shown this already. Um, going from that heavily suited, let's generate some guidance for the 2018 guidance. We wanted to try and make it visible to athletes so that if one of your kids is watching this or, or seeing a poster or seeing something, they might at least go, oh, well, look, hockey's included or netball's included or, oh, that's a famous rugby player. Oh, that's a famous hearts player. Just to try and give some level of um, you know, of, of attachment to the project better than what we were doing because, you know, we, after generating the guidance, we soon realised we need to drill down and actually measure that we're having impact. Sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button there. I mentioned our education officers. So on the back of 2018, to try and improve that, we realised that the advisory group is not the, are not the people to drive the education and drive the message. So we... Um, got some funding and we appointed two education officers um, who were in this photo. Um, that's Dr. Katie Stewart, who is a sports scientist background, but um, her PhD is all in medical education and she's heavily involved in the Glasgow University um, MSc in sports medicine. So in terms of educating people um, around medical topics, that's where Katie's expertise 
sits and her concussion interest sits through her MSc project. And then on the right is Dr. Stephanie Adams, who is a psychologist by trade, but has a PhD in concussion education and worked heavily in Canada, who, although I was champ very parochially champion in Scotland, Canada's another country that has done a huge amount of work on uh, grassroots concussion. So these, this is probably our master stroke from 2018 and that we acquired expertise in how to drill down and how to educate patients, athletes, parents, staff, PE teachers, um, and medics. Medics is actually my biggest challenge that I'll come to uh, still because concussion, this will surprise you, concussion is not taught at all on any undergraduate or postgraduate medical training scheme with the exception of sport and exercise medicine if you're going to try and become a consultant or a little bit in neurology but medical students are always asking us for experience and exposure but uh, to sports medicine and for talks on concussion i was up in aberdeen doing one for the undergraduate sports medicine society um, in november but despite the interest it's not actually managed to sneak into the curriculum at all uh, and that's one of our big goals to try and get it in there. I mentioned earlier on, apart from concussion and sport group, there are three of the Scottish guys. This is the UK concussion guidance. Um, You'll note they've kept the same logo that we have, and thankfully it was a lot of collaboration uh, when they were setting this up. This was published last year in response to a, a um, Westminster review um, looking at concussion in sport, which they did over the previous 18 months, so post-pandemic era. Um, it says UK concussion guidance, but of course Westminster, when it comes to health, is England and Wales, oh, well, England really, but the guidance covers England and Wales. Uh, but we're very collaborative um, and we had some input or at least shared our learning with them around what they were doing. Um, given that one of the objectives of the Scottish project was to make it easier for easy for athletes and PE teachers and everyone by not having lots of different guidance it makes sense that the Scottish guidance walks towards the UK guidance um, in 2024 um, which is what we're doing Hi everyone, I think that Dr. Hi. Hans has just had a connection issue, so just bear with us for a moment and we'll just make sure you can get back online. Hi Jonathan, sorry, it kind of dropped out for a second there, but I think you might be back. Okay, um, <laughs> did, did you get the, the bit about the UK concussion guidance? Yes. Grand. So all I said was we're walking towards them to make it easier for patients and staff. There's no point when our objective was to make it easier for everyone to automatically give us two sets of guidance. So what about the clinical sides of concussion? I've already mentioned this. Um, diagnosing concussion, even for experienced clinicians who do this all the time, it can be very difficult. It can be very obvious. Somebody's staggering, somebody looks clearly dazed, somebody's lying on the floor, not moving. Culturally, in some sports, lying on the floor, not moving happens a lot. Football, for example. But in other sports, it doesn't. Um, rugby league, for example, where if you show yourself to be injured or struggling, the team's going to attack. They see that as a weakness. So culture, there's some differences. Um, so sometimes it is obvious, but sometimes it's not. And therefore, given that we know there is no test that will confidently rule out concussion pitch side, um, the only safe thing to do is if in doubt, sit them out. And if anybody has a concern at all of they were a bit slow to get up, they looked a bit staggery, they just didn't look quite right. At grassroots level, they should be removed and moved to return the same day until you see what happens. Um, or at least until this well, not not return that same day and then be cleared by a healthcare professional. Um, once they've, they've seen someone who's who's seen more concussion than a parent. It's obviously tricky for um so 
say I think they're okay, they can go back on, I would remind them of uh, what happened to Ben Robinson. It's rare, but again, you know, sport's not worth it for that. Why is assessing, why, why is it difficult to assess? It isn't just one thing, multiple things that presents differently in different people. Our brain has many different functions um, across memory, cognition, number processing, balance, um, then physical symptoms like vomiting or um, you know, things you can examine people and find as well, like their balance problems or a type of wobbly eye problem called nystagmus. There are many, many signs. And, you know, so having a test that accurately assesses all aspects of brain function in what is a very complex organ is impossible. So again, it's everyone's responsibility, um, whether you're the referee, the athlete, a teammate, a, a parent, a coach, a PE teacher. If you're thinking, oh, they didn't look quite right, they need to come off and stay off the pitch. There's no video replays at grassroots. Um, you'll see things once. It might be 50 meters away. Um, it might be right in front of you, but you're not going to get to see it again, and there is no test. Um, if if you're a coach or a parent and you're watching your children or teenagers play, you might be you might find it difficult to detach yourself from the emotion of the sport. So again, that's not necessarily that's not a good thing. You must be able to step yourself out and go, hey, hang on, hang on, what's the bigger picture here? And make sure that if you see somebody else doing that, you step in and intervene and say, I don't think they should be back on the pitch. So what about recovery? Way to describe how to recover from a brain injury, um, which is what it is. We say concussion, but it's a lot more powerful if you say it's a brain injury. Um, so we try and move away from that language a little bit. But just the same as if you were, if you pulled your hamstring and you had a marathon coming up, you would not just carry on and try and train as much as possible and try and do your hamstring, do your marathon in a couple of couple of weeks. You just wouldn't do it. You would not rest for two weeks and then try and do your marathon because you fail, you'd break down. A brain injury, a concussion injury is exactly the same. You would do a stepwise rehabilitation, getting a function back in the hamstring, getting strength back in the hamstring, and then beginning to increase your running load. The brain is exactly the same. Oops, sorry, wrong, wrong button. The brain is exactly the same, just as if you would start getting range of motion, strength work, um, you would do exactly the same for the brain. But at grassroots sport, our focus is not, let's get this person back to sport. Our focus is for grassroots sport, let's get them back to normal life. So let's get them back to school, let's get them back to work, let's get them back to socializing, and then let's get them back to thinking about sport. What does it actually look like? So what does the hamstring rehabilitation look like on concussion guidance? This is taken from the UK concussion guidance. Um, it's now called um, graduated return to activity and sport, a grass. It used to be called the GRTP, the graduated return to play. And you can see for the reason I've said why the focus should be on normal life, why um, we've taken to play out of it. And it's fairly common sense. You know, you know, it's 48 if you've got lots of symptoms like headache, dizziness, nausea. It's giving yourself a couple of days of taking it easy, not absolute rest. We know that absolute rest actually is not great, just like that muscle injury. You know, if you want to take the dog for a walk, that's fine. Um, if you've got um, some re rehab to do on an injury, that you've got another injury, that's fine. But just doing common sense things like not spending eight hours staring at, at your phone um and just trying to eat well sleep well recover and then gradually introducing some daily activities at school um, a little bit of light physical activity just gently increasing and over the next few stages you may be going to school for half days or work for half days or working from home for a bit um, right up to building back to normal work and school and once you're 
just about getting back to school you, and you're doing a little bit of activity exercise, you can start thinking about some training type exercise around stage four, stage five. Um, the UK guidance in terms, everybody always asks about timeframes. Um, the whole point of since 2023, we don't like timeframes. We like minimum timeframes. Well, we always have, but we really emphasize now from the UK guidance, it's minimum return of 21 days as long as you've had no symptoms for two weeks before that and that's for all ages it used to be it was separate for children and adults but now to make it simpler it's 21 days for everyone but that's a minimum it's individualized care and there's lots of different people who will have different risk factors and different challenges um, around their concussion journey um, so they may take longer than that but the minimum is 21 days Again, who are those special groups that might take a bit longer? Well, the, everybody always gets some, um, th there's always comments about certain groups. And, um, you know, so for example, children and adolescents, it's a developing brain. We should be more cautious. They may take longer. Females, female athletes, um, their, the symptoms that they uh, report may be more significant. Their recovery may be longer. Um, so we, you know, we need to allow for that if that's the situation. Para sport, people who don't have the normal um, or the as, as wide a range of normal sensory inputs as other people, so visually impaired people, um, things like that, they may take longer to navigate through a rehabilitation journey post concussion. But perhaps the biggest, which I haven't put on here, and if there's one big message that I would put out there to any medics, it people who've had another recent concussion or got a big concussion history. So at medical school, we learn how to take psychiatric histories. We learn how to take obstetric histories when people come in with pregnancy problems. We don't do concussion histories. And, you know, knowing when was your last concussion or have you had one before? When was it? How long did you take to get back? Um, why was that? Um, what treatments did you try? Um, or how, knowing all those sort of things will allow a medic to steer um, somebody through the concussion journey on an individualized manner. And yet we don't we don't teach that. We don't um, in, you know, in medical school or postgraduate jobs uh, and we need to. Um, so that's the biggest modifier probably is is uh, identifying people with a big concussion history, because if you play a sport that's prone to get concussion once, good chance you might get it again. So again i can't talk about concussion without mentioning some of the controversies difficult areas and what we do know and what we don't know um and these are the, some of the things that you know you have a lot of people we have some people in the world who are really struggling with consequences of brain injury and it's terrible and it's it's terrible to think that through participating in sport that has happened to them um but equally on the other side for the vast majority of people being active, being healthy, being physically active, taking part in team sports. It's got huge social, physical and psychological benefits, which are all got a huge evidence base. Um, so it's, it's a really delicate balancing act to make sure that when we're talking about these controversial areas, putting people off sport, we're just doing what we can to make sport safer. So epidemiology, so that means, um, you know, where are all the people with concussion who gets it how, how do we how many how often we don't know um that's one of the problems of we are pretty embryonic in the concussion journey for these sort of things and also a lot of people probably don't come to see medical practitioners or formal medical practitioners like their gp or a and e um, a lot of people would just manage it themselves they go i've just got concussion they have a headache for a day and then feel a bit better um, or they might have club medical staff like even if even some amateur clubs have access to a physio and they may just take some advice off them um, so as for the project we've got to target those people because they're not going to present necessarily to medics and even if they do many of the medics they see doctors and doctors that they see won't be trained in managing concussion which is quite scary really and i can say my um i do two days a week in an, as an a and &E consultant as well as my support work and I would see maybe 10 head injuries a day. I would see there'll be more than that coming in. 
in the A&E department. Um, but almost all of them are due to alcohol, falls and violence. They're not due to sport. So lots of people are getting head injuries, but the sport ones are not necessarily presenting in a way that we can measure who they are or how they are. So that's something that we need to look at of how can we improve concussion reporting in sport. Here's another criticism of the evidence base. So yeah, I talked about the massive evidence base around the health benefits of exercise. Um, there's, there's a lot of work done on that. And um, you know, that, that's um, a real positive, but the concussion research space is limited by geographical area. The majority of it comes from these areas uh, and that's called publication bias. So you know, the, the papers that get into the journals that I would be able to read um, probably come from these these uh, these countries and it's not truly global yet. There might be some people in the Far East doing brilliant work, but just not as easy to access due to publication bias. Again, just popping back to Scotland, um, the influence that Scotland's had, the um, recently about percussion. The Lancet is one of the most prestigious medical journals there is, and there was a Lancet commission talking about dementia prevention, intervention and care a few years ago, and this listed about 17 factors which can cause concussion, uh, concussion, dementia, apologies, contribute towards dementia, one of which is trauma, but there are many others, things like social isolation um, in the elderly, um, things like high blood pressure, um, things like diabetes, obesity, all the sort of cardiovascular diseases. So, you know, a significant review by um, a group of subject experts writing in a major journal concluded that head injury or, or brain traumatic brain injury is one aspect of what causes dementia, um, which is perhaps not necessarily the narrative you might see if you look on social media around uh, concussion. And the thing that I just said there about the emergency department and sports role in head injury. Specifically with regard to Scotland, this is probably one of the most influential papers for, um, for well, for, con for concussion people who are now retired, for concussion sufferers who are now retired. And this is the field study. Um, you can work out the mnemonic from, from the title. Uh, and you'll see Katie Stewart's in there, who's one of our educators, and also Willie Stewart. This came from Glasgow University. It's not, it's not produced by the group that I'm involved in. It's a Glasgow University project. It just so happens that um, two or three people involved in our project were involved in this paper. And the field study is, is um, what, it, what they basically did was they looked backwards. So it was retrospective and they matched um, people's health records to their professions. Um, and they worked out that people who were professional footballers in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, if you match it for everything else like alcohol, you all the other things that are mentioned in the Lancet Commission, alcohol use, uh, socioeconomic status, um, smoking, things like that, um, the, the, the neurodegenerative diseases were mostly all more common in that professional footballer group than the general public. So a real landmark paper. The, the challenges of that interpreting that finding is it's a retrospective study. They controlled as many things as they could, but they're looking back. So you can't sort of blind, blind yourself to everything um, and put particular constraints on the study as it runs to see what happens. You're looking back into the past, which you kind of recognize as not being as strong as prospective studies where you're looking forwards. Um, but it's still a landmark paper and did show that neurodegenerative um, these are more common in, in uh, ex-professional footballers from those generations. What does that mean for now? That's difficult because we're a lot more concussion aware, um, but yet um, players, professional players would do more things like heading of the ball than perhaps they did in the past. I can't prove that. There's no data on that, but just theorizing. But medics are more concussion aware. We take people off easier. We look after people. We stand people down. Yes, there's sometimes high profile mistakes. But generally, as a body, we're more conservative than we used to be. Will that buffer the effects if there is an effect that 
they found in the field study we just don't know and that is the challenge we have in a lot of concussion problems we just don't know <clears throat> there's loads of other studies and again to if you read the headlines um, there are some fairly cutting headlines like that one so the one about mnd being 15 times higher <clears throat> if you're able to read the paper and appraise it you'll see the actual figure or uh, was 15.17 in the orange band that i've highlighted there but the confidence intervals for that range from 2 to 178. What does that mean? Well, that's a mark of precision. So it means that the measured value by the statistical analysis, the measured value is 15.17, but they can say with confidence that the true value is somewhere between 2 and 178. Clearly, that's quite wide. Um, so you know, they can't confidently say that 15.17 is the actual measure, um, you know, the measured value. That's not to belittle this work at all. These are some of the best papers we have done by extremely um, um, valuable and um, skilled researchers. Um, I'm just highlighting the challenges sometimes of doing this research and some of the headlines to get into the, into the papers. What about treating concussion? Well, the treatment is as I've outlined. If in doubt, sit them out, take them off the pitch. <clears throat> if you've got some symptoms, take some medication for it. If you've got a headache, take some paracetamol. Feel a bit sick, take an anti-nausea tablet for it. There are no gimmicks, but obviously in a world where we don't have brilliant evidence for many things, there are a lot of things coming in where people are going, oh, I've got this product, this will do this. Here's my evidence. But actually, if you look at the evidence for many of these things that are out there, whether it's head protection or um, novel therapies, you know, the, the evidence is no better or, some, or usually a lot worse than the evidence that we currently have. So the treatment for a concussion remains, if in doubt, sit them out, take some treatment and follow a graduated return to activity. I mentioned this at the beginning. This is this is a real problem trying to work in the concussion space. There are some really strong opinions um, on this topic, partly because a lot of things play out visibly in high in high profile sport, um, and people see mistakes and have strong opinions. And the current world of social media, um, it is a real challenge to to try and keep people civil in this space at times. So, what coming to the end now? What about for patients? If you happen to engage to a patient or a relative about, or oh, see this scary thing about oh, this concussion, what's going to happen? What does it mean? Um, <clears throat> it's impossible to tell a 17-year-old what to get. Well, it's not impossible. It's very unlikely you're going to get a 17-year-old to, to understand risks if you start talking about dementia or long-term problems from poorly managed concussions. They're going to think they're invincible. They're going to carry on. <clears throat> but you can tell them some things. Uh, and here's a good couple of examples uh, or, or how, how I frame it. And this is how I frame it <clears throat> to the athletes that I work with, excuse me. Um, short term consequences of concussion. If your brain is not working, you will not be able to think properly and make good decisions. Therefore, you're likely to perform poorly uh, on the pitch and give a poor representation of yourself. So you're better off coming off and let somebody else have a go, look after yourself and come back stronger next week. Um, that photo there was um, with a chap holding his hands together. Uh, sorry, uh, the guy with the blonde hair, the white guy with the blonde hair holding his hands together. That's Carius, the Liverpool goalkeeper, who <clears throat> uh, famously had made a couple of mistakes in the Champions League final a few years ago and then subsequently came out in the media um, saying that he actually had concussion during that game and it wasn't diagnosed. Um, so that's a kind of nice tag example I use to people. I don't know if he did or not. I don't know. It was a media article again. Um, but, um, you know, he certainly made some mistakes and that's a nice tagline to show people to discuss about poor performance. The other one, and this is, is evidence-based, is if you're not controlling, if your brain's injured and you're not controlling your decision-making, equally, you're not going to be controlling your limbs as well. Um, you're seven times more likely to pick up a significant musculoskeletal injury if you have concussion than if you don't. So if you're a professional athlete and you pull a hamstring, big deal. Two or three weeks off, you'll be back. But if, you're, uh, if you've got a physical job, you're an electrician, patron decorator, and you rupture your ACL, your cruciate ligament, 
which is a year away from sport and probably an operation. That's a year away from your livelihood. So that seven times more likely is a good message to give to, to, uh, to players. And the third one, of course, is Ben's situation. Um, you know, multiple head injuries on field re resulting in death. That is extremely rare, but obviously the gravity of it can't be underestimated. What about medium term consequences of concussion? Well, um, again, these are a little bit more difficult, but these are the ones where um, recurrent concussions will mean greater time off work, greater time off sport if you get back to back concussions. Um, and then there are various drivers for mental health, whether it's the the lack of being able to play and um, and you know return to normal society, or whether it's a true organic mental health trigger. Um, again, we do, from the evidence we don't know, but clearly a lot of people do have problems with depression in the context of head injury, um, and we're not quite sure exactly why or how strong that link is. The long-term stuff I mentioned it's hard to sell this to a 17-year-old. It is something we worry about. <clears throat> There's no doubt, um, and a lot of high-profile global medical bodies now recognise that being repeatedly bashed on the head is not going to be good for your brain uh, and will put you at risk of developing problems. The difficult thing is how strong is that link, and that's what we can't quite establish in the evidence, uh, how much is too much. But of course, in that world of uncertainty, the the treatment for or the, the solution to that is to be conservative and to protect people uh, and that is why for grassroots sport at least um, we're putting in guidance like we have to try and protect people against um, returning too soon before they've been rehabilitated and before picking up back-to-back -back concussions. What about preventative measures? Well yeah there's a lot of work done on this and a lot of people try and do things preventatively clearly being fit and active having better control of your body uh, for the sport that you're trying to do um you'll, you'll leave you a less of a risk of getting an accidental head collision or an accidental um subconcussive impact which we've not talked about either you know the concussions can be easy to spot but what about the ones that impacts that you get that don't cause concussion but it's still a head impact the significance of those we don't know but people do a lot of work on prevention around neck strength probably important for general injury prevention. What's the, how strong is that link for preventing concussion? We don't know. Um, I say I worked in Formula One. There's a lot of work about preventative equipment there. But of course, it's not about concussion. That's about major injury, major trauma injury. Um, but in other sports, so like head guards, for example, in sports like rugby, there's no evidence that head guards prevent um, concussions. They can prevent wounds, they can prevent lacerations. And indeed, there is some evidence that it leads to risk-taking behavior. You think I've got this protective hel helmet on or soft head guard on, I'm gonna stick my head in there because I've got this protection on. But actually, it doesn't provide any protection. And often, if you go to a mini rugby session, you'll see loads of children wearing head guards thinking this is gonna protect, or parents thinking this is gonna protect me against concussion. But there's no evidence that it does. There's a small amount of evidence that it might actually do some some harm. So to summarize, so Scotland was the first nation in the world to have a single guidance for everyone, all sports, all people back in 2015. Um, other countries have followed now. Australia and New Zealand had a fairly high profile announcement. Canada um, are on a lot of similar lines. Um, remember, it's if in doubt, sit them out. There are no tests to rule out concussion. So if you see something and you think, oh, that looked a bit dodgy, you better taking them off and protecting them against themselves and against others. Um, even doctors only have tools to help them decide. So sometimes it does come down to me or us and our clinical opinion of do they, don't they, based on the evidence. So it's a skilled decision making. Um, Scotland, through our advisory group and now our education group, we do have some contribution to the, the global evidence base. But our biggest strength has been the fact that we've managed to drill down our policy uh, and we've got it in so um, courses for PE teachers and things like that as part of their undergraduate education. But we haven't got medics yet. And the evidence base for physical activity and health is huge, um, much more than the evidence of concussion and harm. That's not to say 
we shouldn't be cautious. We definitely should be cautious because we don't know. And there are some slightly concerning patterns. But our messaging must not people put people off taking part in sport or physical activity through scaring them um, about areas of concussion we don't quite understand. Oh, what is a typo? All brain injuries are serious. And don't forget that occasionally people have died due to poor management. Um, and the, the gravity of that um, cannot be underestimated. And certainly all of us on the advisory board who sit with people you know, owe it to keep pushing this message in Ben's memory. And if in doubt, send them out. That's me. Thank you. Happy to take questions. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Uh, thanks everyone for bearing with us just for that little um, uh, drop in the connection back there. I'm um, just glad we managed to get it back. Um, just as a reminder for asking questions, you just need to click the purple icon and then you'll see the chat box and you just click on that and type your question in there and I'll read it out. But I'm gonna sneak in first um, with my question um, because I was kind of thinking about two things you said because you spoke about um, how concussion isn't in the undergraduate curriculum for medics um, at the moment. But then at the same time, you were saying as well about your experience when you are working in A&E and you can see like, you know, 10 sort of concussion injuries caused by various different things, not just sport um, when you're in that time. Why do you think that isn't covered in the undergraduate curriculum when it is so prevalent in, in places like A&E? Yeah, so of course, in, in A&E, when we see a head injury, we're thinking about, have they got a bleed on the brain? Do they need a CT scan? No. Bye-bye. You can go. That's fine. Here's some advice in case you do have that and we've missed it. So the objective of what we're trying to see in A&E, we're trying to pick up the the ones who might die from their head injury. Um, the the aspects of sport and concussion, it's it's only really been a hot topic and expanded in the last 10 years so we're, we've got a, a population where we're looking for bleeds on the brain and then we've got this novel concept of concussion management and he doesn't see concussion that much um, so how do we influence people to think no you really need to see this as well because people who get punched in the face on a friday night often play football on a sunday morning or play another sport so you know, the, those populations are not mutually exclusive. Uh, there's some crossover, but it, it's really we've, we've got an established practice of do they have a bleed on the brain? Any not really seeing concussion and concussion, be, concussion management being relatively juvenile on the landscape. And just as a, as a secondary bit to that, do you think it's likely that it will be added to the curriculum sometime soon? So again, it's a, it's a major objective of our education group is you know we've we've got traction from the p teachers we've got traction from schools uh we need to get traction from the medics and the physios um it's it's part of our project to make that happen but it's com it's complicated because um not surprisingly the curriculum that medical schools teach is highly regulated on a national level um so it's not just as simple as finding someone who wants to talk about it for a day yeah that makes sense. Thank you very much. Um, first question in the chat is, what are the future goals for the promotion of this type of care? You've mentioned the lack of research and teaching about concussion is improving this, is, is, is sorry, is improving this, the focus? Yes. Um, we just sort of said, um, phase one in 2015, let's get some guidance. Let's get a single policy. We did that. We all sat there patting ourselves on the back. First country in the world, first nation in the world to get to get the policy and then we sort of realized well actually though we haven't got any clout we need to get some clout so that's when we <clears throat> excuse me v2 um in 2018 let's make it athlete centered let's try and get hold of the athletes and let's set up an education group to drill down into all all those projects of course between 2018 and now there was of course a pandemic so like everybody else we lost quite a lot of momentum um so we didn't appoint the, the education officers till after the pandemic, but now they're on year two um, and making big progress in the sort of groups that you're talking about. That's perfect. The one area, sorry, the one area which is more tricky um, is research. Um, our, our aim really is patient management 
and public health messaging. We're not, um, you know, we're not a group of academics trying to develop lots of novel research projects, but um, the universities are doing that by themselves and representatives from those universities are on our advisory group. So we can, if they've got something groundbreaking to say that we need to listen to and include, we can. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the next question, excuse me, <clears throat> is how good generally is the engagement with the guidance from coaches, teachers, parents, etc.? Yeah, um, so that, that's a really difficult one to to answer because I'm not there to observe it, and we haven't done as yet, um, you know, impact a, a wide ranging impact study. Um, though the, that's on the agenda as well. The education um, team are, are looking at impact around, for example, educating the PE teachers in terms of has their knowledge improved. But in terms of actual decision making in real time, I couldn't tell you how effective it is. What I can tell you is many, many anecdotes and examples of feedback, individual feedback, where people have sent a not thank you note, but a kind of complimentary note of going, I'm so glad I had this reference point. Um, this happened and so and so the coach or whatever wanted to put them back on. But I said no. And I spoke to the ref and the ref said no and agreed. So lots of anecdotal um, intervention, um, but not um, not not a wide ranging study to tell you that concordance is 50% or, or something like that. We haven't got that. What is going to happen, by the way, is um, version three um, will be integrated into NHS 24 so that when people find up NHS 24, they will get, um, if in doubt, guidance um, as their advice, not A&E guidance. Have you got a bleed in the brain? So we'll get both, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. That's brilliant. Um, I just wanted to read a comment that somebody left. Um, Gareth Jones, who sadly had to, to log off, but said that that was just brilliant. Many thanks. And he's a professor in epidemiology, but a part time rugby coach as well. So oh. I'm sure I found this very useful. Um, <laughs> our next question is, do you think rugby union can be tweaked to the point where bad head clashes are almost completely gone? Or is that impossible due to the nature of the game? And it's much more about reducing the risk as much as possible with improved monitoring, limiting full contact game time and law changes similar to these we've seen in recent years around tackle height, etc. Yeah, I mean, yeah, World Rugby have got an answer for that, that question. <clears throat> um, and, you know, there, there are many forms of rugby. Um, there's touch, there's... Um, tag where you pull the tags off um there's uh, full contact rugby um there's seven aside rugby um and ultimately the, the nature of the sport is one person tackles another with the ball it is a contact or a collision sport um so the focus is to make all aspects of the game but particularly um, but, you know, but World Rugby's focus is to make all aspects of the game, particularly player welfare, around the contact aspect of the game, as safe as possible. Um, but fundamentally, the key component of the game is one person tackles another who's got the ball to try and prevent them putting the ball over the line. <clears throat> you can modify that through touch rugby, tag rugby, um, but there's always going to be some form of contact rugby or another collision sports, you know, ice hockey, American football all of which will try and learn from the evidence and make it as safe as, as possible. That's great, thank you. Um, and just because you're speaking about rugby, we just have to say a huge congratulations to, to Dr Hansen because he was just recently appointed as the team doctor for Scotland Men's rugby team. So congratulations, that's an amazing appointment. Thank you. Uh, we've got one last question here. Um, how long after concussion would you wait before having massage or sports remedial treatment? Uh, there'd be no restriction on activities like that. Um, anything that's thought to be good for your body in terms of recovery or um, rehabilitation and injury, um, you can do. You can do that. Your early rehabilitation, you can do that um, pretty much straight off in that first 48 hours. Um, 
obviously, like like anything, if you've got neck pain uh, as part of your concussion, which you can have, and it's a neck massage and it makes your neck pain worse, clearly that's not a good idea. But that you wouldn't be usually with the case. Often soft tissue work around neck injuries and releasing things often makes people feel better. Uh, and what you're aiming for is early resolution of all symptoms as soon as possible through medication, rehabilitation. So be a good thing if you've got a sore bit and want massage. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I've got another comment. Um, in my career, I have seen concussion occurring in ski racing and shinty. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, let's just move down. To manage as safely as possible, um, education of all medics and other health professionals involved in sport would seem the way forward to improve management. Thank you for an excellent lecture. So there you go. Very good. Um, we've got another question that's just come in. So do you find uh, do you find one of the issues is making the athletes themselves more careful about concussion? I know even as a child sports person, you want to carry on. So it was likely to be less than honest about how you feel. And so how do you contact how do you combat that? Yeah, um, and that's that's a challenge at all levels of the sport. And it's a challenge for various reasons. Sometimes it's they just want to carry on because they're in the moment in sort of the warrior mode. Sometimes it's because they're actually completely confused and can't make decisions for themselves. Um, <clears throat> so the solution to that is athletes are poor witnesses when it comes to their own state of health on the field around concussion. So we take the decision out of their hand, hands and that's why it's everyone's responsibility. If you've seen something you're not happy about, um, then you should be either alerting the coach to it or if you're in a position where you can, you're the referee, you're the coach, or a parent, you should be taking them off and protect, protecting them. Um, but you, you're quite right. What I would say with that is, in the time I've been involved in this project, um, or concussion as a, as a concept, it's a long-term change management. So in the past, players may have been, some players may have been a bit dismissive, whereas now I don't see that. You know, you get players fighting, so-and-so is not right. Have a look at him. And that's to me at you know more performance level of the sport, um, not, not just the grassroots stuff. So players are a little bit more aware than what they used to be. But you, you're right, removing pe people from the field, if you leave it to the player, might be difficult. So you don't leave it to the player. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's. I think that's all the questions uh, now. The chat seems to be clear. So it's just time for me to say thank you so much, Jonathan, for spending time with us this afternoon. I just thought that was absolutely fascinating and I'll probably be thinking about it for days to come. Um, I'm sure that everyone else is probably feeling exactly the same way. So thank you. Brilliant, that's great and delighted to have given something back. Thank you, right, enjoy your evening, everyone. Take care, bye.